Uh, if you weren't here before, that's fine. Uh, it'll hopefully make some sense here. So chapter 2, 2 Peter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3 this morning. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. And to all these words, God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, Peter's last letter, as we've been uh, thinking about the last few weeks, uh, Peter's last letter is an exhortation uh, to us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus in these last days. So it's a, it's a very strong, a very passionate uh, pastoral exhortation that we would grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as we live in uh, these last days. In fact, uh, if you remember from chapter number 1, beginning at verse 12 down to verse number 15, Peter was writing this uh, uh, as if it was at the end of his life. It most likely he was. Uh, and he was expecting that he was going to leave the tent of this body. He was going to be present with the Lord, uh, meaning that he was going to die. Uh, his body would be buried, but yet he would be taken up in soul uh, spirit to the Lord. And so with that no knowledge that he's about to leave this earth, he's very passionate uh, he's very pastoral. Grow, loved ones, grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. Know that he forgives you of your sins. Know that he loves you with an everlasting love. And grow in the knowledge. Grow in the knowledge of God. Be aware of the times in which we live, which uh, he will go on to say in chapter 3, uh, are the last days. And I'll mention that as well uh, in just a moment. Now, after encouraging the believers in the first century and us, uh, after encouraging uh, believers with the certainty of the Christian life, that's what we saw last Sunday, the certainty of the Christian life, and that certainty is based on something. What's the basis of our certainty as Christians, brothers and sisters? What did we say last Sunday? I heard grace, I heard resurrection, I heard Jesus, amen, 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 okay? But what did we see last Sunday especially? How does Jesus reveal himself in his grace to us? In his word. In his word. Remember from chapter 1, we saw that uh, the Lord has spoken prophecies. Those prophecies have come true. And that is our certainty in this life. And so he's encouraged believers that they are certain and they are founded upon the certainty of the word of God. And therefore, we can live a life that glorifies God in these last days. So it's been happy. It's been, uh, you know, it's been, uh, as they say, uh, unicorns and rainbows, right? It's been great. The story's been great so far. Lots of happiness, lots of positive stuff, lots of uplifting stuff, lots of gospel, lots of good news, lots of uh, encouragement to us, and then he throws a bucket of cold water on us. Beginning in chapter 2 to the end of the book. It's only three chapters, but this letter, this book. He now transitions to warn us. He's been exhorting us, he's been encouraging us, he's been uplifting us, now he warns us. And a good pastor has to know how to do this. We have to not only uh, lead the sheep with our staff, but we also have to use the rod at times against the wolves, amen? He transitions here to warn us about false teachers, and sadly, it's false teachers within, within the church. So notice their existence beginning at verse 1, or just verse 1, their existence, right? These, these false teachers exist. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as, notice the analogy, the parallel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Among you. So how do we go from that encouraging chapter number 1 to this? Right? How do we go from 0 to 60 in 2.2 seconds, and now we go the opposite, back down, throttle down to 0 almost immediately? Well, note the connection back to chapter 1, verses 16 to 21, which we saw last Sunday. So if you weren't here, here's the good news. You're going to get a quick little uh, sermonette, okay? Chapter 1, 16 through 21. Peter said before he left this life, 
he wanted to remind these believers of the truth that he had been proclaiming to them about Jesus. And this truth was not, as he called it in verse 16, cleverly devised myths. Some were preaching this, cleverly devised myths. No, Peter said, we were eyewitnesses and we were ear witnesses to the glory of God and Jesus Christ upon the mountain of transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. But even more, he says, the certainty of the Christian life it's not just that Peter saw it and the, the apostles heard it, but we all, we all have the prophetic word, meaning the Old Testament prophecies, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Prophecies that were uttered th hundreds, even thousands of years before have been embodied and have been fulfilled in the life and the ministry, the words, the deeds of Jesus. And so therefore he told us, pay attention. Pay attention to these scriptures as to a lamp that shines in a dark place until the day of Christ's return dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So pay attention. Until the coming of Jesus, you've got to pay attention. And the word of God that's been fulfilled in, in the Old Testament, that is like a lamp for our feet, a light for our path, the psalmist said. In other words, we're living in dark days. We're living in dark times. And the only light in darkness is the word of the Lord. Amen? It's the word of the Lord. It's God's light to us. And these prophecies, again, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, quickly, these prophecies of Scripture did not come from someone's own interpretation or the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus are the words of true prophets. Follow those words. Listen to those words. Follow them like a light in darkness. Live upon them as a certain foundation in the quicksand of this life. As Jesus said, blessed is the one who hears my words and does them and builds his life like a house upon, uh, upon a firm foundation. But woe to those who hear my words, do not do them and build upon the sand. Follow my words, hear my words, he says. So the Old Testament prophets have spoken of Jesus to come. Jesus Christ has come. He's fulfilled those, those words of the prophets. And now the apostles, as Jesus' representatives, are saying, hear these words, hear them all. Why? Because there will be, there, just as there were false prophets in times of old among the people of God in the Old Covenant, there will be false teachers among you in the New Covenant. As it was in the beginning now ever shall be, sadly. False prophets arose among the people then. There were true prophets, there were false prophets. In the same way, there are going to be false teachers among you. In contrast to the true teachers like Peter and the apostles. There were false prophets among the people of God in, the, in ancient days. Just notice that briefly. Uh, one New Testament scholar summarized what made up a false prophet. Three little bullet points. They didn't speak with, the divine, with, with divine authority. That's why Peter says, true prophets don't speak of themselves. Prophecies don't come from anyone's per particular personal will. Men spoke from God, and so false prophets did not speak with divine authority. Secondly, false prophets in the Old Testament, as you uh, no doubt know, uh, their messages were always only of good. Peace, peace. Security, security. They never spoke of repentance and judgment. Some of us who come out of Pentecostal churches, we probably, we probably know this too. Every time someone ever stood up and gave a prophecy in church, it was always positive, it was always happy. The Lord wants to bless you. The Lord says, this is somebody who's back who's hurt, you're going to be healed. The Lord is good, and you are going to be blessed with goodness and blessing and riches and wealth and health and prosperity. It was never evil, it was never that. You need to repent, never that. But true prophets like Daniel chapter 9, we see that. They don't only speak of the gospel and the faithfulness and the, and the love of God, but Lord, we've sinned against you. And that's why we're here in exile, He's been, he was praying there. And so false prophets didn't speak with, with divine authority, and they only, always only spoke of good, peace, security, so forth, never of repentance and judgment. And thirdly, they showed themselves to be worthy of condemnation. 
Note the parallel hill, uh, here, just as. In the same way there were false prophets in the Old Covenant, just as in the same way there will be false teachers among the people of God in the last day. You see that in verse number one? Just as there will be false teachers among you. Now, here's, here's the question to think about just briefly is this. Why does Peter use a future tense in verse 1? False prophets also arose, past tense, among the people, just as, notice this, future tense, there will be false teachers. Why? Is he warning them of false teachers that haven't yet affected them? And by application, are we to read this still off into the far-off future uh, of the quote-unquote end times? That's one, that's one reading of the passage. Later in chapter 3, at verse number 3, Peter says, In the last days, scoffers will come. Again, speaking the future tense. But we know that Peter believed that he was already in the last days. In Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, who stood up and preached? Peter. So people heard these languages the mighty works of God in their own languages, and, they, and some accuse them of being drunk. It's still the morning, it's not even noon, and they're already drunk. What did Peter quote to refute them? Remember in Acts 2, what's the Old Testament text that he quotes from? About the Spirit of God being poured out, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will prophesy, and so forth. What's the passage? The prophecy of Joel, chapter 2. So Acts 2 quotes Joel 2. And in Joel 2, the prophet said, In the last days, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And Peter says in Acts 2, that prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. It is the last days of Joel. And so when Peter says, in the last days, scoffers will come, Peter believes that we're already in the last days. Scoffers already have come. In fact, in chapter 2, we're going to see uh, the rest of the chapter, and then even in later uh, in chapter 3, Peter speaks in different tenses. He speaks the present tense in chapter 2. These false teachers are in the present affecting and, uh, 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 and infecting the church. So why does he use the future tense here? I think it's because Peter's quoting from prophecies about false teachers to come. He's quoting Jesus' own words and Paul's own words. He's saying that from the vantage point of Jesus and Paul, false teachers will come. That's what they said. That's what we see. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Again, verse 24 of Matthew 24. False Christ, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And so Peter is saying, just like Jesus said, we're seeing this. False prophets will arise in the church. But he's also reflecting Paul's words. Paul's famous words in Acts chapter 20, he's speaking to the Ephesians after being there for three years, and he tells the leaders of the church there, I know that after my departure, fierce fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. But then he says this, and from among you, From your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. That's what Paul said. Do you think uh, Peter was aware of Paul's writings? Do you think the apostles knew what each other were saying in writing? We know that because in chapter 3 of our passage, uh, of our book, 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter even says that he's aware of Paul's writings, and in fact, some people twist some of Paul's writings because they're difficult to understand. Paul's quoting here Jesus and Paul. Uh, Peter's quoting here Jesus and Paul. Fierce wolves will come uh, come into the church from the outside to eat up the sheep. But most importantly, as Peter says here, from our own ranks, there will be false teachers among you. So that's the big warning. Jesus said it. Paul said it, and now Peter is saying it. So what's the application of that? What's the application of the warning that there will be false teachers among you in the new covenant? What should we do, brothers and sisters? 
Be ready, be alert, be aware. Is this just my task as a pastor and doctor in the church? Is it just my task to be aware? False teachers are here. Wolves have come from the outside. False teachers have sprung up. There's weeds here. It's my job to go around and pick up the weeds, right? Is this just the task of our elders, the, the governors of the church? Who's, who's Peter writing to here? Look at verse 1 again. There will be false teachers among whom? You. Who's you? This con- these congregations, these believers, these churches. Is that you? Is that you? Yes. yes. Be alert, brothers and sisters. Oh, but this could never happen at my, at my church. No, 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 no. Wait, these people, you people are just way too nice. Never, never, never. Not him, not her, never. Not, a, not, a, not an OURC, no, never. In 24 years, brothers and sisters, you may not know this. This has happened. This has happened in 24 years. And it's going to continue to happen. Be alert. Be alert. Notice then he gives us an expose, we might say, of who these false teachers are. Kids sometimes, uh, well, at least when I was a kid, we, you know, we watched the news at night at home, but we don't watch the news anymore. Uh, we watched the news at night back in the day. We'd watch some show, you know, bedtime was at like 8 o'clock or 8.30, and there'd be some show on, and like right at the end of the show at 7.59, the show would end, the, credit, the end credits on the screen, uh, and then there'd be like a little, a little like screen would pop up, and it'd be like, news at 11, crime spree, rages and ravages the city, police put out a sketch, and then like there's like this dark picture, kids, like this crayon or this uh, pencil sketch right, like with a gray, gray pencil on a white paper, and you see this, this scary-looking dude. It's always, it was always a guy, right, scary-looking dude. He's got like a hoodie on, some kind of sunglasses. Looks like he's, looks like he's not the kind of person that you want to meet uh, on a dark street at night. Police sometimes can't find uh, who, uh, who's the suspect or the culprit of some kind of a crime, and sometimes police kids have to ask for a, uh, for a sketch artist, Right? For a sketch artist, uh, London, you can, you can probably make a lot of money doing that someday. I'm sure you can. <laughs> Police are like, hey, we got some witnesses over here. You know, we got Leon, we got uh, Sadie. They, they saw this person breaking into that building. Uh, so Leon described, and then Sadie described. And as they're describing this, what this person looked like, you're, you're, they don't see, but you're sketching. And eventually, you know, you can see this person. Okay? His nose looks a certain shape, and his eyes are a certain way, and his ears are in a certain position, and maybe his hairstyle you know, looks kind of looks crazy. Who knows? Um, and then they, they put this out. And it's, but it's just a sketch, though, right? It's not the real person. It's just a sketch. It's sort of a representative picture of what this culprit might look like. Uh, we don't know his name, and uh, you don't know his like, social security number, his phone number, but you, you get a sense of who he is. So Peter here is giving us a sketch of these false teachers, an expose uh, on who they are, uh, what they do, why they're so dangerous, why you and I need to be alert. First of all, they're devious. They're devious, verse 1, secretly bringing in destructive heresies. That word secretly is used by Paul. Again, it's, we can see some of the, uh, the interchange between the apostles. Paul used it uh, to speak of the Judaizers in the book of Galatians who secretly came into the church. Now, in that case, these were people from the outside coming in, but, Paul, uh, but Peter here is saying from our own midst, they're going to secretly bring in destructive heresies. Later in chapter 2 of of 2 Peter, uh, Peter is going to describe these false teachers as being arrogant. As being arrogant. So how do we make sense of that? They're they're secretly bringing in false teaching, but at the same time they're arrogant, right? An arrogant person doesn't hide in the shadows. An arrogant person is out there. So what what is he saying? What is he saying? He's saying it's not so much that they're hiding their teaching, Uh, but that they're trying to make their teaching sound as much as possible like the apostles, all the while 
covering up the rest. It's like a magician, right, says, you know, look at this coin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this, this coin disappear before your very eyes, and all the while their hand is in front of you with a glove on and they're motioning. You don't look at the other hand, you don't see what else is going on over here, right? Magicians do that, they're good at that. It seems plausible, I can see what the person's doing. But behind, over here, I can't tell what they're doing, and somehow they're, they're pulling off their trick, right? In other words, we have to be aware of what teachers are, not just what they're saying in front of us, but we have to ask questions. What are the implications of what this person is saying? Because they might be holding something back, trying to hide something. To sound plausible, on the one hand, well, this is apostolic, this is what the New Testament says, this is what God says. But on the other hand, there's something else secretly coming in like a Trojan horse behind the scene. So they are devious. False teachers are devious. They don't subscribe to a truth in advertising. If you, want, you want to know what I believe? I'll tell you exactly what I believe. In this church, at least, we have confessions. Uh, we're a confessional church. You want to know what are the church's official stances on X, Y, and Z? Uh, we can pull up our confessions and tell you. And if they don't speak to those things, then we may not have a position on it. But there's no hiding what we believe the doctrines of the Christian faith. But false teachers secretly bring in, trying to sound plausible, yet all the while, like a Trojan horse, bringing something into the back door to be able to bring in destructive heresies. But notice, secondly, they also deny the Lord. They deny the Lord, even denying the master who bought them. Again, verse 1. Now, notice that word master there. Normally, the word that's used for the Lord uh, in the New Testament is kurios, uh, which is the, old, uh, the New Testament translation of the Old Testament, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. So normally when we speak about Jesus as Lord, he's kurios. But here, there's another word that's used, despotes. Despotes, master. Comes into English as a despot or despotic, right? A tyrant, we use it in that kind of a sense of a tyrant, a despot, uh, a bad ruler. But what it is is a word that underscores the absolute sovereignty and lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, their denial is so serious that Peter uses this other word for the Lord to emphasize his mastery, his lordship, his power, his sovereignty. They deny the Lord, the almighty Lord, by their teaching and by their living even denying the master, the sovereign, the sovereign Lord, who bought them. Who bought them. That word bought, uh, agarazzo, is one of the words for uh, redemption in the New Testament. It's redemption language, to purchase, to buy back. Slaves who are purchased, slaves who are freed in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, right? Uh, but the language of redemption, to purchase, to buy, uh, to take ownership. So how do they deny the Lord? How do they deny the Lord? Well, on the one hand, they could be denying him theologically. Again, they're speaking words that sound very plausible, but all the while they're bringing in their false doctrines. How? Well, it's clear from 2 Peter that these false teachers, uh, at a minimum, at a minimum, were doubting the second coming of Jesus, if not outright denying it. That's why what we're going to see in chapter 2 and especially chapter 3 that Peter is so zealous to emphasize that Jesus Christ is returning. There are scoffers, there are mockers of the last day who say, where's the promise of his coming? Things keep happening like they've always happened. There's no second coming of Jesus. That's just a myth. So on the one hand, this could be a theological denial of the master. They might be giving lip service to Jesus as Lord, all the while saying, he's not coming back. Why would they say that? Because what they're really doing is denying him in their actions. Sometimes we say, the proof's in the pudding, kids. The proof's in the pudding. I don't even know why we say that. Like, what's inside pudding? I don't know. We say, the proof's in the pudding, meaning... Like, you'll know something by it's being done. So you'll know a false teacher, not always just by their words, but by their actions. The proof is in the pudding. These false teachers wanted to live a lifestyle that denied in practice that Jesus was the Lord. 
You see, kids, when we say that Jesus is the Savior, we, that means that, we, we know that that means that he saves us from our sins. He forgives us. But Jesus is not just the Savior. He's also the Lord. What does it mean to say that he's the Lord? The Lord. That means that he's the king, right? He owns us. He's the master. He's the sovereign king. And he's almighty God. But to say that means that you're not. To say that Jesus is Lord is to humble yourself underneath him. But when you want to live a life that doesn't show that he's Lord, but that you're Lord, well, that's denying him, according to Peter. In fact, there's a parallel passage. You can just turn over a couple of books in the New Testament to Jude. Uh, it's, it's one sh- uh, short little letter, one short little chapter. Uh, Jude 4 is a parallel because the same vocabulary is being used in the same context. And so Jude verse 4, we read this, uh, quote, certain people have crept in unnoticed. So there's that language again of secrecy. And here it seems like, again, it's sort of like the Judaizers that come from the outside in. Uh, they are ungodly people. Right, so they've crept in secretly. They are ungodly people. What do they do? Who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. There's that word, despotes again, and kurios. The Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. They pervert the grace of God. How? Because some people were saying that because Jesus forgives you of your sins, therefore you can live as you please. Didn't Paul say this in the book of Romans? Oh, so if if God's grace superabounds above and beyond all of my sins, where grace, uh, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. So the more I sin, the more grace I get. And so Paul asked, well, should I continue in sin that I might receive more grace? Absolutely not. That's a mindset and a question and an attitude that shows that you don't really know who Jesus Christ is and that you've never submitted to his lordship. And so that's what these people were doing. They were hearing the gospel in words and they were twisting those words and saying, aha, see, we can still live the way we want to live. We can still do what we want to do. We can still... commit sin and be, and be safe and sound for eternity. You see, to put it bluntly, most false doctrine is a cover for false living. Why do false people, false, doc, false teachers teach false doctrines? To cover up some false living. Why do you think the prosperity preachers are so all about, you know, I, I've got my own personal jet. Keep giving. I got I to gotta pay, the, pay the mortgage on that jet. I got to pay that loan off. Oh, and by the way, if you sow $1,000, the Lord's going to bless you with $10,000. They don't really believe that. They believe that if you give them $1,000, you give them $1,000. You're going to get squat. Nothing. You might be able to write it off, but you get nothing to cover up for their false living. People want to give a theological justification for their sinful desires. Denying the master who bought them. Not just in their words, but especially in their deeds, their actions, their lifestyle. The proof's in the pudding. But Houston, we got a problem. We got a problem, though, in this passage, don't we? How can they deny the master, the sovereign Lord, who redeemed them? If Jesus redeems someone, they're redeemed. How can they deny that? It's a difficult text, isn't it? We're a Reformed church. We believe that Jesus Christ, when he dies for a person's sins, he satisfies the justice of God, he effectually brings them to know him, and he preserves them to the end. There is no losing salvation in a Reformed church. Amen? No, we don't believe in the, the loss of salvation. But then what about this passage? So yes, it's a hard saying, it's a difficult text. Yet, there's a simple way to understand it, I believe. Just as Peter is here paralleling the false prophets in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the the false teachers now in the New Covenant. Notice the parallel. So there's a parallel between the Old and the New. 
False prophets, false teachers. So there's also a parallel between us, right? This would be, uh, the parallel was the people of God then, and now you. There's a parallel between what God was doing in the Old Covenant and what God does now. In other words, like this. Think of it like this. Was Israel redeemed out of Egypt? That's like a ridiculous question, Pastor Danny. What are you even saying? Of course, Israel was redeemed out of Egypt. And when God brought them out of Egypt to the wilderness, to, the, to Mount Sinai, did God call Israel a chosen nation? So they were all elect. Did God call all Israel a royal priesthood? No. Oh, Lule, Lule, Elder Lule needs to be uh, re-educated, I think. <laughs> Didn't he say you're a chosen nation, a royal priesthood? He did, he did. Okay, good, good, we're good. All right, we're back on track here. <laughs> but then a whole generation is in the wilderness, and what happens to them? They don't believe the Lord, and what happens to them? They die in the wilderness. That's why they wander for 40 years. For 40 years, they wander, and God, one by one, plucks them off, and they die. Yet they were all the covenant people of God. They all received the promises of God. And God even speaks of them. We would call this a judgment of charity. We can then say every single Israelite who came out of Egypt was elect, redeemed, forgiven, saved. But we're speaking of that in a judgment of charity. That's what we call covenantal language. Everyone looked like a believer. They walked like a believer. They talked like a believer, we might say. They were members of God's covenant people. Yet they denied, some denied the Lord. How? Well, because we know that theologically speaking, underneath all that, behind all that, behind the eternal curtain of God, not all Israel are Israel. Not all in the covenant people Israel were Israel. Were actually elected from the, before the foundation of the world. We're actually redeemed from all their sins. We're actually drawn by the Holy Spirit to put their trust in Him. Actually, would, uh, uh, Not all were actually going to be preserved and persevere throughout their lives. It's the same amongst us in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. The church is a huge body of believers. And we speak, as even Peter does, we speak to congregations as those who've obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. We, we speak in a judgment of charity of all people who are assembled together under the name of Jesus Christ. But we know that not all actually do believe in Jesus Christ. We can, I, can, I can address you as an assembled congregation and say, congregation of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 100% I can say that. God knows the, the truth. God knows the reality behind the scenes. I don't know what's going on inside of your heart. Only God knows that. But we can address the whole congregation as the people of God. And so here there were people that looked like believers, that acted like believers, that even talked like believers, but ultimately they showed by their fruits that they weren't believers. They denied in action the Lord who bought them, just like the Lord bought Israel out of Egypt. He redeemed them just like he redeemed Israel the people of God out of Egypt. So, these people are, thirdly, destructive. They are destructive. They bring in, secretly bring in, destructive heresies. Uh, this is not speaking in a technical sense of condemned doctrines like we might speak of it, but uh, in the New Testament, heresies, uh, the, it's to divide people into groups, parties, factions. In other words, these false teachers introduce opinions that divide. They introduce, they introduce opinions that divide the body. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos, right? First 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And notice the sad reality. Many will follow. Many will follow. So let me, as your pastor, encourage you and to, and to say what I always, I think I always say, uh, as a, as a congregation, let's keep the main thing the main thing. 
We believe the scriptures, they are God's words to us, and we have, and the, the history of the church has passed down to us, faithful summaries and faithful expositions of those, uh, of those words of God in the Old New Testaments. We have creeds, we have catechism, uh, we have a confession of faith, we have the canons of Dort. Uh, these are our approved and authorized official doctrines. Let's focus on the things that are the main things. So while we're being aware and being alert of the fact that there can be false teachers, not just amongst us, but in general, the, the body of Christ, at the same time, we have to not just be, be aware and be sort of skittish about everybody that talks to us. No, that's not, that's not the point. The point is we should also love the truth. Love the truth. Be committed to the main thing. Focus on the, on the majors. Don't major on the minors, brothers and sisters. And when we do that, we won't have to worry about being divided, having destructive heresies, having many opinions amongst us. Now, notice these heresies are these divisions. They're destructive now among the church, among the body of Christ. Uh, again, verse 2, many will follow their sensuality. So that shows you, again, they denied the master in their actions. They wanted, to cover, they wanted the cover of theology to cover their lifestyle of sensuality, of sexual immorality. If that doesn't sound like 21st century America, I don't know what does. The visible body of Christ in our country more and more is wanting to have a cover, a plausible cover, a plausible, uh, plausible words that sound apostolic to cover their sexual sinful desires. Right? There's, there's no like mincing words about that. One of the top New Testament scholars in the world, whose son is one of the top Old Testament scholars in the world, just came out with a book basically saying all the verses about homosexuality in the Bible are not true. God's changed his mind, they say. If that's not, if that's not using words for cover for sexual immorality, or at least to give cover to other people for their sexual immorality, I don't know what it is. And these kinds of words, these kinds of teachers, these kinds of false teachers, they destroy churches. They divide Churches, they cause factions in churches, and sadly, many will follow their sensuality. So if people deny the second coming, like, like these teachers seem to be doing, we'll come to that some more, I mentioned, uh, then there's no foundation in this life for ethics and the Christian life. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if there's no resurrection on the final day of human history, eat, drink, be merry. Why? Tomorrow we die. This is all there is. Live it up. Enjoy while you can. These heresies or these divisions, they are destructive now among the church, but they are also destructive among the world. Because of these false teachers, verse 2, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of these divisions, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Why would I be a Christian? Why would I waste my time on Sunday morning? Why would I waste my time being a believer and doing all the things that I've got to do when I can follow these guys over here who say I can live it up? They blaspheme the way of truth. The false teachers have a greater condemnation, though. Notice fourth of their destiny. Swift destruction. Back to our text. Swift, bring it upon themselves, swift destruction. The idea of swift here is not fast uh, per se, but it's certain that when the judgment comes, it's certain. That, that's what the idea of swiftness means here. This destruction is eternal destruction, it's hell. What's hell? Loved ones, we haven't heard about hell probably in a while. What's hell? Is it real? As real as heaven? So what's hell? Well, sometimes we hear, though, that it's, it's uh, a place without God. But isn't God everywhere? So, it, so God is in hell. It's just that there's no hope of grace, right? So it's not the absence of God. No, it's the absence of the hope that God is going to give you a second chance. That God is going to give you mercy. 
There's no hope of grace, no hope of having a restored fellowship with him, no hope of repentance. God is there actively in judgment. And that's why today is the day of salvation. If you're here today, if you're here today, you don't know Jesus, we invite you to come to follow him with us. Follow his way of truth. Flee from this judgment to come. You don't want to go. These false teachers' condemnation is from long ago, we read in verse 3, is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. It looks that way to us from our vantage point. It looks that way. This is what he's going to say in chapter 3. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like the Lord. The Lord is not slow. The Lord hasn't forgotten his promises of grace the same way. The, the Lord sometimes looks slow to us. Why is he not destroying these false teachers? Why is he not purifying his church? Why is he letting his church be divided? Their condemnation is from long ago. It's not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. Let God be God. Let God sort it out. Finally, the fifth thing here, just briefly, uh, they're defrauding. Notice, in their greed. In their greed. Verse 3, they will exploit you. How? With false words. With false words. The cleverly devised myths of chapter 1, verse 16. The word that, uh, the word that Peter uses here, false words, that word false, uh, speaks of forgeries. They forge the true words of God. Again, they want to look plausible. They want to come in secretly and, and they want to make their doctrine look up front plausible and apostolic and biblical, but behind the scenes, no. No, they want to, they want to foist upon you a forgery. So you see that there is truth and there is error, my friends. There is truth and there is error. This is one of the big things we take away from this text. There is truth, there is error. We live in a pluralistic society. You're free to believe or not to believe. That's what it means to be an American. But we believe, but we believe that there's absolute truth. And we can find that absolute truth in Jesus Christ, who's revealed himself to us in the words of the scriptures. In the word of God is absolute truth. That's where we find Christ. That's where you find salvation. That's where you find hope. That's where you find meaning, purpose, significance in this life. And again, we pray that you'll explore these words of the Lord Jesus Christ with us, so that you grow with us into that same conviction to come to know the truth, because the truth sets you free. But we live in an age that tells us, doesn't it? That tells us, speak your truth. Speak your truth. Which, is, of course, itself is a statement of absolute truth, right? Speak your truth. There's no absolute truth, we're told, except the absolute truth that there's no absolute truth. Don't think, just feel. Yes, your feelings are given to you by God, but they're also changeable depending on chemicals in your body, environmental factors, circumstances of life. You need something else, something beside yourself, something outside of you, more than you, not dependent upon your feelings that can betray you. You need the truth. Peter, that's what Peter says to us this morning. In this warning is, yes, there's truth, and there's error. Let's stand on the side of truth, the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he warns us, loved ones. He warns us. We're Christians. We believe in the gospel. We love Jesus Christ. He loves us. We want to hear the gospel, the good news of his free forgiveness, which we have. We've heard this morning already in our singing and the absolution of our sins. We have that in the Lord's table. All the good news, all the grace, all the gospel. At the same time, we've got to hear the law. We've got to hear the bad news. And Peter, as an apostle, just like Jesus, and I as a pastor, have to speak not just the good news all the time. That's what a false teacher does. They've got to speak the, speak the truth, which is that there's bad news. And so be alert. Be alert in these last days that false teachers may spring up among us. The remedy is to love Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. Let's be so enamored with Jesus that no false ideas ever enter our minds. Let's be so familiar with his voice that no false voices can lead us astray and affect our lives. Let's be so familiar with him as the genuine article that we're so familiar handling him just like a, a person who knows the, the genuineness of real money. They're so 
taken up with what the real thing is, that the, the false, the imitation, is so obvious in an instant. Let's be, let's be so familiar with Jesus. The genuine article, the counterfeit will be easily spotted and rejected. Amen? Amen? Let's praise the Lord that He's given us His Son, Jesus, this morning. He protects us. He keeps us on that way, the straight and narrow way. And even in our sins, even in our straying from Him, even in our wandering, even in our doubting, even in our struggles that we have with His truths, loved ones, He's given to us the Word and the sacraments. And as you come to the table of the Lord this morning, come with confidence that uh, it's not about your works, as we sang. It's about Jesus Christ's works for you. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. We bless you and praise you for your amazing grace. Uh, preserve your church across the world. Preserve our church, our congregation that we love. Preserve us in the truth. Help us, Lord, to propagate the truth, to, uh, to share the truth, uh, to know the truth, that it sets us free, and we pray that it would set others free as well. Lord, give us a sober-mindedness of the warning this morning, but also, Lord, a joy that uh, you are the God of grace, the God of truth, the God who reveals himself. And we can find that revelation so clearly and so certainly in your word. Help us, we pray, to be devoted to it. And by being devoted to the word, to be devoted, most of all, uh, to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen.